Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. My name is Thiago Mendes, potato breeder at the International uh, Potato Center based in Kenya. Thanks for finding time for, for this event, using potato wild relatives in pre-breeding for new source of genetic variability. The, the idea of this event is helping to raise awareness of the potential use of potato wild relatives for broadening the genetic variability of breeding programs to meet the challenge of climate change. And it will, and it will additionally explore opportunities and challenge uh, of the new hybrid breeding system, breeding strategy. Huh? Some housekeeping information, it's on the screen. So videos and microphones off for the participants. The session is being recorded and use the chat to post comments and the Q and A button for questions during the, the presentation, please. Um, uh, for the open remarks, uh, I would like to invite Hanele Linquist Cruz and followed by Benjamin Killian. Uh, Hanele is uh, the senior scientist and division leader of crop improvement at SIP. And Benjamin is the senior scientist of plant genetic research from, crop, from Global Crop Diverse Trust. The floor is yours. Thanks and welcome everyone. Um, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome everybody for this event organized by SIP and Global Crop Diversity Trust. As you know, uh, potato is the third most important food crop globally, and it's especially important for food security. According to FAO, potato production in developing countries expanded by nearly 200 million tons from the 1960s to 2018. Some modeling studies have been done that indicate that the impacts of climate change on potato yield are favorable when compared to other major crops like maize, rice and wheat, and therefore potato may become even more important crop globally. Even though the yields may increase, the crop still needs to adapt to new planting windows and uh, we have to consider new emerging pests, pathogens and uh, abiotic stresses and therefore breeding for new varieties with these resistances and in addition to heat and drought tolerance continues to be very important. Crop wild relatives of potato are known as sources of new traits and alleles, and several promising uh, crop wild resources have been identified and used in pre breeding to incorporate some of those into elite backgrounds. In this webinar, we will hear examples of such successful cases. You also may know that. The direct utilization of uh, crop wild relatives in breeding can be quite challenging because of various reasons. Um, and furthermore, the integration of these traits into tetraploid cultivated potato also brings along challenges. Most of the commercially cultivated potato is still tetraploid. For example, uh, stacking of multiple traits in tetraploid background is a very long-term process. But luckily, hybrid breeding at the diploid level can solve some of these bottlenecks of traditional potato breeding. And uh, we will learn more about this during the second day of this webinar. So with this uh, short introduction, I want to wish all participants a very successful event. I hope that the presentations of today and tomorrow will stimulate lots of new ideas on the utilization of crop wild relatives in potato breeding. One day our food security may depend on those genetic resources. So many thanks for, uh, to all participants and uh, I pass it over to you, Tiago. Thank you. Thank you, Hanele. Benjamin. Thank you very much, dear Hanele and Diago, dear potato community. On behalf of the Global Crop Diversity Trust, it is really my great pleasure to welcome you all to this workshop. This expert workshop is really timely 
and important because our world is changing so fast. And as you know, plant domestication and crop improvement, they have resulted in reduced genetic diversity in most of our cultivated crops, thus limiting their potential to adapt to future challenges. And improvement via crop breeding requires access to novel, to beneficial alleles. And indeed, crop wild relatives, they are potentially valuable source of these novel alleles. And pre-breeding refers to a wide range of activities designated to first identify the beneficial characteristics in crop wild relatives, and then second, to transfer these beneficial traits into breeding pipelines. So pre-breeding forms a kind of bridge between the gene banks that hold and safeguard the crop wild relatives and the breeders and farmers who use them. However, pre-breeding is really challenging and costly and a long and laborious process. It's a continuum of activities and thus so far, whenever possible, pre-breeding pre efforts were largely avoided. You know, and but climate change is forcing us now to seek for all useful traits from all available resources, including crop wild relatives. So we clearly need long-term efforts and substantial investment in pre-breeding. However, this is still very rare. Fortunately, there is such a long-term initiative and that's the crop, the, the crop wild relative project, generously supported by the Norwegian government and coordinated by the crop trust. On one hand, the CWR project is a global collecting effort. So our partners collected in 25 countries over six, six years and more than 4,500 crop wild relative samples were collected. For instance, wild potatoes were collected in six countries. In Peru alone, more than 300 wild potatoes were found. And of course, these newly collected crop wild relatives, they must be multiplied and also become available under standard material transfer agreement conditions. And so the Crop Trust is also supporting a multiplication project at SIP formerly led by Noel Anglin and now by Norma Manwick. And on the other hand, the Crop Wild Relatives Project is also a global pre-breeding partnership, and we are supporting more than 100 partners in 50 countries on 19 crops. And potato is one of these crops. And we at the Crop Trust, we are proud to support the potato pre-breeding activities and during two phases, so over seven to eight years, we, we supported potato. These were pre-breeding, but also evaluation projects led by Meredith, Bonia Bale, and Diago Mendez under their great leadership. So first of all, I would like to thank all our potato partners for their outstanding commitment and really remarkable achievement. And among those partners are, for instance, Grupo Yanapai, but also Emprapa Brazil and Inia Uruguay. So I'm really looking forward to this expert workshop. I'm looking forward to fruitful discussions and future collaborations. And I would suggest let's build on your achievements, but also on this current momentum. And one such Great thing can be seen here on this screen. I hope you can see this. So actually the potato pre-breeding work was recently highlighted and was on the cover page of Crop Science. It is volume 61, number one. And behind here we have Flor Os Osorio from, from SIP, right? From our CWR, um, potato pre-breeding project and Diago and others, they will provide more details here. This is one example. And the other one, of course, is 
the upcoming CWR derived variety release in Peru. So I'm looking forward to this expert workshop and I, I'm thanking you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for, for your words. Uh, we really appreciate uh, this partnership. Over to you, Meridette. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you, Hannah Lee, and thank you, Benjamin, for the introduction. Um, the workshop, as was mentioned before, will be spanning two days. And today we have two sessions uh, of, with a total of five speakers. Each speaker will have 15 minutes to share their experiences with us in, in either of the two sessions. Uh, without further detail, uh, let's launch session number one. The first session for today is uh, referred to as uh, potato breeding case studies in which uh, three scientists working on potato pre-breeding and variety will release will share with us their experiences uh, largely in Peru and in, uh, in Brazil. So the first speaker um, is Tiago Mendes, as he was already introduced, he's a uh, potato breeder for CIP based in Nairobi. And his topic is broadening the base of potato by pre-breeding for late blight resistance with wild crop species. Thank you. And let's proceed with Tiago's presentation. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, so allow me to Yeah, now here we are. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so we'll be talking about like uh, this broadening the, the base for late blight resistance. But first, allow me just to briefly talk uh, in two slides uh, about the, the crop wide relative project we have on potato, which is uh, crop wide relative derived potatoes for climate change resilience and farming community in Kenya and Peru. So yeah, SIP has been work on preventing for quite a long time and. And the Global Crop Trust really provide important you know, support for the last, um, the last seven years, eight years. And it's been uh, very important for us to continue this work that has been done for many other colleagues uh, in the past. So for the current project that we are having and we are ongoing project, we have um, two main objectives, which is uh, selecting, selecting promising prep breeding materials for farmer traits of interest and those related to climate change for late blight and VW. And here also we combine some heat tolerant material that we have on the background of the main breeding population. And also in the second one objective is to validate and introduce a novel variation for drought tolerance and late blight resistance into two egg self compatible. So you have some photos here. So on the top, like the, the participatory variety selection for late blight resistance that Maria will be talking the sequence in the next presentation. And then on the bottom, we have a photo from Embrapa. It's a trial that was um, uh, implemented by our colleague Carlos. And um, yeah. So for the main traits we've been working on, so we have bacterial drought and late blight and late blight announced with the PVS. That was another technique that I'm going to talk uh, today, right? So on top of that, we also work on, on heat, basically combine the genetic resources that we are developing for bacterial yield. So then we cross the bacterial yield with the, the heat tolerant, tolerant materials uh, that we, we are developing, right? So uh, yeah, so here's just to highlight the species that we are working on for each one of those traits. So you can see that it's a quite a, a number of species. Um, the case of late blight, for instance, we have quite a number, but we concentrate our effort on the first three because of uh, you know seed availability and so on. So uh, coming to the topic, broadening the genetic base for resistance to late blight. Yeah, I want to highlight that is a work that has been done for SIP um, uh, for quite a long time, and then just take it uh, in some point, and we are moving it. Um, to the next level. And, and then you're going to see in the next presentation from Maria, she's going to explain the work that Yanapa is doing in terms of participatory variety selection that are clones derived, derived from this work that was done combining um, the, the crop wide relatives with some advanced clones 
So, and then we end up uh, being successful uh, selecting some materials uh, for, for, for release. Uh, let me explain the process, how it was done, this broadening process. I mean, how we were using the land races uh, uh, and, and crossing them with wild species. So the first step was uh, the introgression of 2X, uh, you know, breeded cultivated potato. So this was an interspecific cross followed by an embryo rescue. So the late blight resistant test in an open field. So then, uh, then we checked those materials that had like 2M gamete uh, production for then we could cross them with like a tetraploid one, right? So these first generation clones selected so we call them air clones, like embryo rescue clones. So the second stage was uh, crossing those clones that we that were resistant to late blight and to to tetraploid, those those that could produce two n gamete polling, right? And then this generation we call uh, the hair clones. That would be the the hybrid generation. Huh? And the third the third stage is about the assessment of new the new four hybrid, the new four X hybrid, that as I said, we call hair hybrids for late blight resistance, agronom agronomical and adaptation traits. So, and then there was a series of uh, selections round and also verifications of other traits until we could uh, narrow down like a population of 1000 genotypes to 28 genotypes. So yeah, those 28 genotypes we've been working with it for for the last five years in participatory variety selection and also doing some other assessments. So those clones of the best ones has also been used um, in, in our, has been used in crosses uh, with our, our main breeding population to introgress those late blight uh, genes. And, um, and they have been screened for those traits that uh, late blight resistance, yield, pollen availability, high dry matter content, you know, all those traits related, important for, for the potato breeding in this, in this third stage. And of course, the, the best ones, um, they are available in the gene bank for international distribution and uh, links for, 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 for the information, a few data and also links for, for but the pedigree information will be available after this event on the web page. So here, just to briefly show the performance of those materials, the advanced ones that were tested on the, on the breeding trials by Manuel in Oxa Pampa, Peru in 2018. Uh, this, it's an unreplicated trial and um, yeah, they were tested just together with our breeding populations uh, in Lima. And this Oxapampa, it's a place with a high um, pressure for late blight. And then as you can see, uh, the materials, they, they got a, like a consistent yield uh, and then very resistant to late blight, comparing, for instance, to the local Czechs, Cori, Amarilis, and Iugai. And this Cori, it's a very resistant material, is the one that we use in our breeding program as a Czech as a resistant one. And the other one are just commercial checks, um, actually the dominant varieties in, in Peru. Um, yeah, of course, um, the, they are not yielding much because the pressure of late blight in that region is quite high. That's why they yield for this, the three varieties and other, the three checks like was, were lower comparing to the, the other clones or the, the clones that were selected. So it's quite remarkable to see uh, how those materials in just like one generation, one, yeah, one, one crop, one, the first introgression to the tetraploid level uh, with this performance in the field. And of course, um, you know, looking for the traits, so there'll be room for, for improvements, but it's really remarkable to see the, um, you know, the performance of those materials under field conditions, not just for you, but Special for late blight, right? Yeah. So, what is the next steps for this work? It's really, you know, uh, we are working now on a manuscript to document the whole process and 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 demonstrate how everything was done. 
Uh, and then in the case of the air clones, the air case, we we have developed we have a mapping population segregating for late blight resistance. So genotypes deriving from the air clones, like in 2x level, and cross it, crossed with the SLI donor hybrid. And the second case, we have the hair clones now on the tetraploid level that we are genotyping um, the selected hair genotypes and their correspondent, corresponding gene parents for X and also the 2X, the Solano Kahama cancer background. So then that's what we expect is really to check whether those are new late light genes and, and, and understand a bit better the background of this resistance, right? Yeah, so just remarks, uh, the data, as I said, it's uh, we have like ongoing uh, uploading this data on the open access on this link here that also uh, we wanna um, make it available on the website of the event. And the old germoplasma that were developed under the, the CWI project on potato, either like clones in vitro TPS, because most of the materials that we are developing now, we making we are making crosses and, and we have seed segregating for um, a diverse set of traits. They, they, they will be available for international distribution and the, the least of those materials will be, uh, we wanna post them in the website of the event as well and make it clear. So um, uh, Norma will be also talking about the gene bank and how, how this can be requested to the gene bank. Yeah, so here, just because those are the clones, the advanced materials that eventually uh, end up now uh, being uh, tested with farmers. Uh, with this picture, I wanna thank you, uh, Yana Pai here, uh, having um, Maria Escura on the picture. So thank you so much for the support and for the amazing job that uh, your team has done on selecting and, and, and engaging the farmers in Peru uh, towards the release of the new work of uh, one. One, uh, one variety, right? And here is the team from SIP working on crop wide relatives. From the left to the right, we have Manuel Gastel, a potato breeder, then Cristel uh, is uh, our MS students, and Flo Rodriguez, that was in the, in the cover of the, the crop science, and then myself, and then Mariela. Yeah, those, this team has, has done like an amazing job in the last three years for the second phase of the crop wide relative. So thank you guys so much. You really, I think we really, we have done a, a good job. So, and here I would like to, to, to thank all the partners that were involved on, on this project and, and we keep engaged, you know, discussing and, and, and learning from each other. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you, Tiago. Um, uh, in progress that's been made with using the crop wild relatives, particularly in the case of late blight resistance. Um, the next speaker is Maria Scura. She's from the Grupo Yanapai in Peru. And her topic is uh, participatory variety selection. And she'll tell us about the next stages in evaluating and preparing for varietal release of some of the most promising materials that Tiago has just um, presented to us. Uh, Maria, I think you have 15 minutes and well. Okay, so uh, this talk is participatory selection for varieties. And next, please. Okay, uh, the big challenge that we all are facing is climate change. And there's multiple challenges in the Andes. Uh, one of them is that there's 2 million small farms in the Andes and 82% are under five hectares. People who visit um, the Andes farmers are always surprised and, and think that it's not like farming anywhere else, but it's like horticulture. And uh, just now we, we visited farms with the HZPZ breeders and they couldn't believe the smallness of even the, the, what is considered a big farm, maybe half a hectare, a big potato field. And uh, of course, frost, drought, hail, late blight and Andean weevil have become uh, prevalent. Uh, for example, this year, uh, some of our farmers lost all their 
their potato crops due to frost and drought, first drought and then frost. And this brings food insecurity, which of course uh, comes out as malnutrition in the small children that is hard to recuperate. And it also uh, makes out migration much stronger because young people are not staying in farms and that uh, has a, also a, a cost because there's very little labor. So can you pass to the next one, please? Okay, so here uh, is SIP, you know, always saving us with new resilient varieties to stress. And uh, this is um, the big success is that, as you already heard from Tiago, uh, this, this year where they're going to release a new variety called Matilde. And the, the colored bit is where the, where the wild species comes in, Solanum cajamarquense. And of course, I'm, I'm all, this only zeroes in on the big success. It doesn't zero in on all the work that goes behind it, but it, it, this particular cross, wild species, with a diploid clone uh, was done, uh, uh, can't, I don't know the year, but it was, it was, they are called ER because with embryo rescue, they were successful. And these crosses were done by Matilde Orrio. And this is why this variety is, is gonna honor her because um, what, what is the miracle is that can you pass to the next one, please? Yeah, you can see how you went from Solarum Cajamarquense on the left-hand side to the variety on the right-hand side. And as Tiago already said, in two generations. And, and th this uh, is like, I've worked with wild species before when I was a nematode breeder. And we had 30 years of introgression going from wild very slowly towards cultivated, in, uh, back crossing, back crossing, back crossing, and often losing the traits unless they were major genes. And this, uh, this ability to go from this wild diploid to a variety through, through this method that was used is, uh, is all I'm going to say because it's all been like at least 14 years of SIP work and I'm just going to continue how the breeders um, and with the, with farmers zero in on this variety. So pl please and next ones. So for farmers it's an opportunity to participate in selecting potatoes adapted to their farms. It's a learning experience. It gives them access to new seed and it is maybe some empowerment which we need to work on but they often say that in the manuals but it's not you know then it's often not uh, not the reality for seed the access to farmers fields is quite crucial when i started as a breeder at sip we worked in the experiment station and when when what looked really good went out to farmers fields they often were the lowest yielders so having real access to where real farmers grow potatoes is a privilege and the, the fact that they can do it in relatively cheaply because the farmer will put in his labor is, uh, is, a, is very helpful. Uh, it's a way for SIP to hear farmers' voices and they get information of how material is performing for release of new varieties. And of course for SIP, to identify clones that can be used as parental material is very important. Can you pass to the next one, please? So um, the methods that are used for participative plant breeding are not always the same. In the old days, uh, we used a, a method called adopt the clone where different families would adopt the clone and, and decide whether it was good or not for, for them or for the community. Next one, please. Now we're using a, a method 
that is called the Mother Baby Trials, which is based on Siglinde Snap's work in 1999. She did it on maize, but it's basically uh, involving farmers at different stages. In the case of potatoes, uh, the farmers come in and evaluate the clones at flowering. They uh, evaluate them at harvest. They, they evaluate them at storage and they also do a taste test. Now, it, why is it called mother baby trials? Is because the, the mother trial is a design with, with um, replicates that uh, are, allow statistical analysis. And the baby trials are where the farmers take, again, like in the old time, they take just one rep and also have an, an ability to choose them in their own farm. The interesting thing about this method is that there is a, a balance between the statistical analysis, which always skews breeders in one direction or another with farmers' opinion. And the way that farmers um, votes counts is that it's quantified because they, they will put votes in. For example, here you can see they're voting for what plant type they like best. And here they're voting for after a taste test, they, they are putting in which ones they, they like best. So in this way, you can quantify farmers' opinion. Next one, please. Well, this is a manual about, ma ma this is in a SIP web page, but this was translated to Spanish and printed by IICA and USAID. And it's now quite common to use this participative plant breeding method uh, with a very good protocol. Uh, next one, please. Well, this is how we started in 2016 with those uh, 16 clones that Tiago told you about in two locations. One was in Pomavilca and one was in Quilcas. In Pomavilca, you can see all men, hardly any women. And in Quilcas, it's almost all women and hardly any men. And the, the men are very commercially oriented and are interested in varieties that they can sell to the big market in Lima. And I have slightly more land for farming. And in the case of Kilkas, most men have migrated and women are very interested in food security. So, so in a way they, they have different aims. Uh, could you please pass to the next one? So at flowering, uh, interestingly, both uh, both uh, communities rated late blight. They also, farmers in the Andes are very convinced that thick stems or vigorous stems will make the variety stand up to frost and hail. And, uh, and so they, they selected a certain number of varieties during the flowering stage. Next one, please. At harvest, of course, they're looking at tubers. And in Kilka's late blight resistance was still very important. Cooking time, yield, and tolerance to weevil. Whereas in Pomavilca, the, the shape they wanted was to be similar to the variety Yungai, which has a good market. And they figured that if this variety looks similar, they will have a, a, a good opportunity to be, to be bought by the middleman for the market. And they had other problems like wart, weevil, and so on. So, but of course everybody would like a nice yield that there's no difference between farmers and breeders there. Next one, please. Uh, well, here are just the ones that were selected in those first years. Next one, please. Well, and, and here, uh, the difficulty of, of making sure that the taste test is done well because they're now having to rate appearance, taste, and texture. And the next one, please. Th this biplot analysis that SIP 
uh, can do is where they can rate yield together with farmers' preferences for taste. And you can see that several of these varieties uh, go into the quadrant of high yield and, and are also selected for good flavor. Next one, please. So the outcome of this first phase was that yes, these her clones were adapted to farmers' environments in the high Andes and that they met their criteria for potential new varieties. And then at that point, that project ended. And next one, please. So now, in to, so a year went by before new funds came in and thank you to the Crop Trust. And uh, look how many trials were planted with this extra funding in 2018 and 2019. And I'm not going to, um, to go through all the details. Uh, luckily, Maria, Maria La Ponte has done that and has come up with uh, the winner between all these different communities. Just want to show you uh, that uh, the, the map, Huancayo, is straight east of Lima and slight, the farms are slightly lower than in Huancavelica where they reach almost, there's a, a couple of farms that are above 4,000. So it's really surprising how well these clones did in such harsh climates. Uh, next one, please. Uh, well, just, um, this is just the same thing, just yeah, what 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 um, what the participative mother baby trail does is uh, that it recognizes individual and group knowledge and their experience of farmers, and farmers' voices are being heard. Uh, farmers use their own criteria, but as I said, they often coincide with breeders' criteria. Uh, interestingly, women are recognized because their voting is done with different color, with different seed. And so, um, so that uh, illiterate or, or Quechuan speaking have an equal footing when they give their opinions in these fields. And uh, for farmers, they get the seed before varietal release, which should give them a, an, an advantage. And uh, of course, the data analysis give, should give equal weight to visual and taste evaluations. And, and, um, and often these communities get a chance to give the variety a name. They often call them after their own communities. But in this case, uh, we gave it a, a name from somebody at SIP. Next one, please. Uh, here's a chance also for SIP to listen to the farmers because farmers in their, in their ratings for varieties, often say things that SIP is not working on, like resistance to early blight. Uh, so many farmers have problems with weevil, although SIP worked so many years to, they gave up breeding for weevils, even though they have sources of resistance. So uh, they, they, you know, the idea is not to throw in the towel, but to pick up difficult problems. Uh, because uh, it would really help them. Resistance to frost is again, it's a, it's a problem that, well, we have a bit of varieties, but we don't, ha we have lost so many varieties to frost this year. So it's back on the farmer's agenda. And next one, please. So, uh, yes, I mean, it's not only one variety that's a breeding goal, like if this variety should be a commercial, has commercial interest, then the middleman needs to be involved because if you leave it to, to, the, to the small farmers um, to manage middleman, these varieties will never be adopted because, the, uh, because middlemen will not know them and will not buy them. So it's very important to get the, the the chain involved if uh, you want to make it, these varieties a success. Although uh, the farmers who participate, they will keep the seed and, 
and they will spread the seed around, but it becomes very local and doesn't really spread, you know, in a bigger area. And also in partic participative breeding, farmers often select ones that are not the only winners because, you know, for example, right now, there's a second one that is a second winner that is better tasting than Matilde. And many, many farmers think we should actually, um, we should actually release that one. So we have to maybe get two varieties out of, out of this, this lot because the, it's such a, such a, it's such good material that this hybrid vigor between 2N and 4X is something to be exploited. And I think that's the end of my talk. Next one, please. Yeah, well, here I had some photos of the variety again, but uh, since my, my talk didn't come through, I, that's all I, I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria. It's been, an, it's been an excellent example of the importance of the local evaluation and the wider evaluation with the farming community. And the next speaker is Arione da Silva. He's from Embrapa in Brazil, and he's going to speak about bacterial wilt resistance. I think Tiago mentioned that there are two major biotic stresses dealt with along with climatic change traits in this pre-breeding project. So Arione da Silva is going to talk about pre-breeding for uh, resistant to bacterial wilt. It's a pleasure to be part of this workshop. Thanks. And uh, this presentation was prepared by myself and Carlos Lopez. Just a, a little bit about Brazil. Uh, Brazil, potatoes in Brazil uh, is about uh, 3,000, uh, uh, 300,000 acres, and uh, the production is about 3.7 million tons. And uh, this, uh, the potato is grown in a, a wide range of latitudes, as you might see in, the, in, the, in this map. And uh, this, this starts showing the, the, the main production regions. And uh, most of the potato goes into a fresh market, and part is, is going to the to the, to the processing that is growing up in this moment. And uh, these uh, areas of Brazil, of production in Brazil are subtropical in the, in the south and the tropical in the, the rest of the country. Uh, the priorities of our, our program related to the stresses is, uh, biotic stress would be late blight, PVY, bacterial wilt, early blight, and the abiotic is heat tolerance and drought tolerance. And just just to working with those six priorities, and uh, we can show with a kind of a success we had on working uh, on uh, resistant to PVY. And uh, now uh, I take the opportunity to say thanks to SIP and uh, especially to Meredith that sent us a, popula a, a TPS population from what we selected uh, uh, some clones and then they, they were crossed with advanced clones that uh, we have in our program and came out with this nice potato that is uh, getting market in a high standard quality uh, that uh, the, the fresh market demands. And this, uh, this source of resistance was from uh, Stoloniferum. It's, it, it, uh, it's just a, a, a kind of example of that uh, insisting on looking for uh, material, uh, wide, crop-wide relatives, we, we might come out with a, a kind of end up product like this Camilo. And uh, how about the, the, 
bacterial will to resistance. Well, we had been working for many years and uh, it's a long, long range, long time work. And also uh, here we are report about the project with FIP and uh, in Uruguay that is doing a really nice work using the Solano Commercioni as a source of, of bacterial wilt. Uh, it was in, in, in 2015 that we, we received uh, uh, three, th 13 TPS progenies from the near Uruguay. And then this, uh, this, this progenies came from across uh, Third break cross morally and uh, just a tree from uh, back cross four. And uh, they were crossed uh, uh, with this source that they have been developing in Uruguay. And here you see the, the, the seeds of this progenies, this TPS were sown, and then there were. Uh, the seedlings were put in, in, in pots and uh, uh, harvested this, this, these tubers. And uh, you can see Matias Gonzalez is a researcher from INEA, Uruguay. And uh, from these seedlings, we got 1,089 seedlings, uh, approximately 100 seedlings from each progeny. Uh, the first uh, generation we selected for tuber appearance and from this uh, uh, first generation was not in the field infested with uh, bacterial wheel. Uh, it was just for tuber appearance and we got 189 uh, selected clones that was approximately 16% of the selection it was, was not that tight. And uh, uh, in the second year, in the second generation was in, was in a field inf infested with the bacterial. And uh, then we selected for bacterial uh, with, uh, resistance and for tuberal appearance again, and uh, for absence of internal tuber defects. And, and this, in this generation, we selected 32 clones. Uh, approximately 70% of the clones. And then you can see in the map of the, the field that uh, uh, some uh, market green were uh, good, uh, with good resistance and good plant vigor. And those on market red were uh, with very susceptible clones. And here, some of the, the clones that are taken to the, uh, taken to the field, and then we look at that, the, uh, the internal defects, and we see on the uh, on some that we have some uh, hollow heart, and other we have this uh, brown brown uh, uh, from the heat. Then we again, you know, we took the 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 plants. Uh, uh, the clones to the next generation. That would be the, the, the second generation of uh, ex second ex exposure to the, the bacterial uh, uh, infested field. Yeah. Then we selected for bacterial wilt resistant on basis on, on, the, on the wilted plants, plant vigor, no virus symptoms, to be appearance, absence of internal defects. And from the 32 clones, 14 were selected. Uh, about 44% 44, 44 of the clones were selected then. This is the field on the left uh, and uh, about the, the harvesting on the right. And then we went to another generation, third generation with in an infested field. Yeah. And uh, as, a bad, as a matter of fact, this, the, the main uh, race of, of uh, 
bacterial there is race one. Yeah. Uh, then we select for the same same traits: bacterial root resistance, plant vigor, no no virus symptoms, tuber appearance, absence of internal defects. Uh, from this, we get those those clones that we, as we told in the slide before. And we see on the, on the left some of the examples that we selected, uh, we, we took out, took off uh, from the field, those with low vigor that we can see in number one, and the uh, uh, leaf roll that would be might, would be a, a symptom of, of virus, and the others uh, we, we see better vigor, better plant uh, growth. And when we, we look at the at the uh, two eighteen and uh, and two nineteen generations, we see those clones that were selected from this this uh, this uh, progenies, you know. And then we we end up with just five clones that we see this uh, uh, market with uh, yellow uh, arrow. You see, looking at the progenies of uh, that were selected uh, clones, we see that we got the the best clones from this population, just from three, from three uh, progenies. It's eleven o thirteen that we got two clones from this pro, uh, from this progeny. Uh, 14, 150, we got one, and 14, 148, we got two clones. As I told you, two clones were uh, five clones were selected from this population of more than 1,000 seedlings. And uh, what about comparing uh, with uh, the clones that we have been selecting in BRAP for many years? And the, 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 the work with uh, development of, of material for resistance to bacteria wilt, uh, it was started in the end of, of the 80s. And then we compare and we see from the left, uh, Cruiser 148 that is used as a, as a check. And then the first one was MB03, that was the first first clone selected, then the next one, MB9846-01, uh, was the second one, and the, the others, uh, MB19510, and then MB5603, and the other, and then we end up with the, the most advanced one is MB5402, uh, you know, Several uh, back crosses were made with the original material that came from SIP, and uh, it was uh, 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 several sources, I guess, that were used in SIP, like Fure uh, uh, and others. And uh, when you compare the advance of, of material that has been selected uh, through time by Embrapa to those clones that selected from the population received from, from in, in here, Uruguay, we note that uh, uh, the, the percentage of wilted plants taken as a, a, to, a plant tolerance, plant resistant to, to bacterial wilt we see that uh, we have quite a, 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 a good group of clones selected there in, in Brapa. And uh, of course, there is some uh, variation and most of these clones, they have good stability of resistance. And, uh, and uh, uh, Asterix and Agatha, do, to the two uh, susceptible 
cultivars that are the main cultivars used in Brazil. And uh, uh, you see the, 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 the five clones developed or selected from population of Uruguay. And mostly uh, three in this, in this trial, three were uh, compared to the, what Brazil, what have been selected by, by Embrapa, which means that they are, uh, they, they show good resistance and good material to be, to be uh, taken in, in other uh, work and advanced to more uh, better material. The point is that all these materials, the, 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 the great challenge is to reach uh, uh, a good quality of tubers. This is just to see uh, the, the, the material you selected. You have two from, extra minutes. Okay. To the, the five uh, clones that have been selected from India, uh, uh, Uruguay, and the sea that uh, they are not bad in relation to, to the uh, tuber uh, shape, uh, tuber uh, characteristics. And this is from Embrapa, and uh, uh, you see they they have been advanced, and the the, the MB fifty four dash two is the most advanced one, and the and this clone has been put in the farmers this year for the first time. The the, the farmers are trying to see how it goes in their fields, not in the fields infested with bacteria, but in in fields where it is producing for the market. Just to, to say that this is Carlos Lopez that has been dedicated almost 30 years into improvement of bacterial root resistance. It's a long, long time working on that. It, it means that uh, what has been done has, is achieving good uh, uh, advances important for the for our country, important for the world that work with bacterial root resistance. Thank you. And thank you very much, Arione. That was an excellent example. Also, um, I think that SIP and other programs are very grateful to the expertise that has been built up at Ebrapa over these years in working on the imp important uh, disease of bacterial wilt. And I think that we're pretty close to on time, and that concludes the first session after our three speakers. Now we're going to proceed uh, with a break. There will be a video if you want to stay around, but you're also free to leave the computer and come back in 10 minutes. Could I just ask for a check of the time with Mariella or Viviana? Are we on time for this break? And at what time should we be back? Thank you, Marie. Uh, we are going to be back in five minutes. Okay. What um, we are we are not able to show the video right now, but just get a simple banner. But we'll be back in five minutes. Okay. Thank you very much for the speakers, and we'll hear from other additional people in five minutes.
Um, okay, good afternoon. Um, I hope that everybody enjoyed the break and is back in order to listen to our second session. Uh, the second session will move on to consider conservation of genetic resources in the context of using crop wild relatives. We have two speakers, again, with 15 minutes each. The first speaker is Norman, uh, Norma Manrique. She is germplasm specialist at SIP, and her talk will give the view from SIP on the conservation, availability, and use of crop wild relatives and prebred potato germplasm. Thank you, uh, Norma. Could you please proceed? Perfect, uh, Meredith, thank you so much um, for the introduction. Can you see the slides? Yes, they look fine. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation to this webinar. It is a pleasure for me uh, to have the opportunity to talk about the SIP gene band, the role that it plays, uh, distributing germoplasts for breeding, for research, for education, for farmers, small farmers, and the role that, that the gene bands in general play also with research and evaluation of the germoplasts. Um, so my outline for this presentation is talk about um, the importance of the gene bands, the genetic resources that we conserve at SIP, um, key aspects of conservation, uh, documentation and distribution, and talking a, a little bit about some projects of acquisition and research that are ongoing in the, in the gene band and, and, and have made an impact, isn't it? So the gene bands, and especially these gene bands, that they hold a huge uh, mega diversity uh, from the uh, CGI AR centers, uh, we have a special mission which is provide a safe and cheap means to secure crop diversity and ensure access to that diversity for, for food and agriculture. And we do this uh, through different actions. Uh, so acquisition, conservation, characterization and evaluation and distribution. Important to highlight that all of these genetic resources that we hold in this type of uh, gene banks are protected uh, legally under the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. And mainly uh, the goal of this treaty, of this agreement, is to recognize the farmers' rights, their enormous contribution that they have uh, to generate all of those, this diversity in the crops that feed the world. And also the, the goal was to establish a, a global system to share germ, germ plus, uh, to have access uh, for breeders, for farmers, for scientists of all of these uh, crops, mainly the ones that are in the annex one of this uh, um, treaty. And, and also through the um, standard material transfer agreement, um, reach the goal of share in between different countries, the germ plus, but also make sure that the people that receive the germ plus for breeding, for education, for, for research, share the, the benefits uh, derived from the, the use of those genetic resources. Um, so uh, we, in the gene bank work in a framework, we must comply with international standards for conservation and distribution. We need to have mm, conservation methods that they are cost efficient, secure, reliable, sustainable, uh, make sure that we keep the fidelity of the collections, establish um, copies, security copies of those collections. And so our goal is to reach 90% of uh, availability of that germ plus, have security copies of that germ plus up and put available for the user all the information that is possible to have linked to each one of the accessions. Uh, at SIP uh, in Lima, we um, do the conservation of potato, sweet potato, and nine and different uh, Andean and root and tubers crops, and of course, their crop wild relatives. We hold around uh, a little bit more than 17,000 different accessions. And probably as, uh, many of the people that are participating in this webinar know these are clonally propagated species. Many of them, they are. Um, 
polyploids. So it's necessary to keep individuals for the profile that the specific traits that they have been uh, selected over years and evolution and, and the farmers. So, uh, in order to do conservation of this type of genetic resources, it's necessary to, con to maintain the plant itself or part of the plant that is able to produce a new, a new plant. Uh, initially, those collections were maintained in, in field as a clonal collections, and it's uh, still the case for us with some of the Andean roots and tubers. Uh, crops, but uh, that's not the safe way. The, uh, the in vitro conservation offers a clean and a safe way to keep this germ plus. And it has mainly two strategies. One is to keep the in vitro conservation at very low, uh, slow growth rate. So we can keep that germ plus for, um, for medium term conservation, easy to distribute. And uh, the second strategy is long-term conservation. And basically we use cryopreservation methods in order to do that, where we uh, freeze a piece of um, um, tip or uh, axillary node that are the parts of the plant that can produce a new plant in liquid nitrogen, my, one, my 196, minus 196 uh, Celsius. So um, the germ plants can be there for 50 years, 100 years, long period of time. For the crop wild relatives is different. We want to conserve the greatest diversity we can. So we conserve seeds uh, at minus 20 Celsius. And in the seed gene band, all of these genetic resources, we do the distribution of all of them if they comply with the, the requirements to distribute the gene plus. And that is, is to be free of viruses and uh, have, we need to have the legal status in order to share through the SMTA, um, have the genetic identity verif verify, and for seeds, have a minimal number of 2,000 seeds and um, 70, at least 75% uh, viability. And uh, once we have that, we can comply with the requirements of each country as for pe uh, importation permits, uh, have um, phytosanitary certificate and an exchanger the year plus. So as you can see in these tables, we have put the number of accessions that are available for in vitro and for, for seeds, and it's around 60% of the collection that is available for distribution. Um, okay, so people get interested in the germ plants if they know information about, about the germ plants. So, we do mainly morphology characterization, ploidy assessment, taxonomy assessment, working projects for doing evaluation and characterization of the germ plus, genetic profiling and analysis of uh, diversity, and put as much information as we can in public place, uh, places as like the Green Global <clears throat> uh, website that is our Jimban platform. Uh, Genesis, and we have our gene bank website. We have created an online ordering system for the people to go there, request the germ plus, all the accession, they have a DOI number in order to track the germ plus. Uh, we also look for information um, that has been published for um, um, scientists that have requested the germ plus and also if we have participated in part of those um, research. And so we link that information to, to each one of the accessions if they are throat tolerant, GL, vitamin A, content sugar. I mean, information that we find. And we work with, uh, with other partners, national and international. And for example, the G2P SOL project where we are uh, genotyping and phenotyping the core collection of potato and with scientists at seed, for example, this project of characterization of late blight resistant uh, using, uh, looking for that late blight resistant in, in the crop wild relatives so in, of potato. Uh, and, and here a, a catalog um, of that work. So we also publish subsets of the potato, for example, uh, Color um, artisanal colored potato, the mini core uh, collection, the top most distributed germ germ plus, similar with sweet potato, uh, orange flesh sweet potatoes or purple flesh uh, sweet potatoes. These are uh, 
sets of less than 20, around 20, 30 accessions that the people that easily request and, and start some studies. And we also work um, generating catalogs and, um, and uh, as um, Tiago said this morning, he wanted me to do an special slide for explaining how to order the germ plus. And of course, in vitro, all of those embryo rescue germ plus is uh, in the gene bank. And so you can access that germplasm. And if you need to do the ordering of that germplasm, just go to the um, um, gene bank website or just zip website and you will find this icon that is gonna take you to the main page uh, for ordering germplasm. You can select the, the, the crop. If you have the number of the accession, go for the list or I mean, uh, or go straight for the subset, uh, subset. If this is too, compli too complicated for you to follow, just contact us. If this window is going, uh, is going to pop up and you can just request your plus, make questions, or send a message to zip your plus um, at CGRO um, at, uh, uh, H. So Jim, sorry. So that's the way to, uh, to find us uh, and request the general plus. Um, so we also work in enriching the, the collections and this is also, uh, Benjamin was mentioning this morning, we have participated in this huge uh, project of crop wild relatives collecting uh, around 300 accession. And as he said, after 20 years that couldn't be done any collection at SIP. Uh, in 2017 and 2018, where, where that was done this uh, me collection mission. Currently, we are doing the seed increase of of, of the of these accessions, uh, and we have only 267 accession still alive. Uh, we work also with the community. This is a nice project uh, here in Peru, um, assessing the diversity that the communities has, and also identifying gaps in the in the um, cultivated collection of potato or at zip and, and, and acquiring that um, diversity. And this amazing program that is a repatriation, returning a potato land races, native potato to their place uh, in the, to the communities in, in Peru is a project that has last uh, more than 20 years. Mm, and we work also in projects, for example, currently uh, this year we started working in a project sequencing wild potato uh, genomes. And uh, also this other project that is with the uh, other seven the gene banks in the gene bank platform uh, of the CGR centers, uh, uh, assessing the, the diversity within the species. And as you can see in this graph, uh, some accessions, they have a huge, huge diversity. Some other accessions, they don't have that huge uh, diversity within, within the, 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 the accession, uh, the species. Mm. And we Norma, work also- Norma, you have three minutes extra. Okay. <laughs> I think that I almost done. Um, so and so probably it's going to be time for some questions. Um, so the, we also work with the communities in, in, in other um, projects, for example, with diets uh, to fight anemia and, and child malnutrition. This is an example in a school here in Villa del Salvador in, in Lima, Peru, um, promoting uh, the consumption of uh, orange sweet potato and also teaching the, the kids how to grow the, the sweet potatoes. Uh, so all of this um, is possible and the role of the gene banks and impact can even go further, further if, if we, we work together uh, plant scientists in different areas, plant pathology, soil, plant physiology, social science, and breeding programs in, in, in order to really bring uh, something for, for improving food uh, security for the humanity. So um, with that, um, that is the message I wanted to uh, just give to all of you. Thank, Mary, you very, thank you. Thank you very much, Norma. Um, 
for explaining to us a bit about the ongoing and the very essential and proactive role of the Gene Bank. I understand that some of the activities are seriously constrained by COVID, and I hope that you can recover all of the distribution activities very soon. Yeah. Uh, as far as the questions go, uh, Norma, we are going to have a question and answer session at the end of the uh, session this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Let me take the opportunity to, to introduce Paulina. So she will be presenting how to increase the use of crop wide relatives in pre breeding germoplasm. So the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this meeting. Um, can you hear me? It's okay? Yes, I can hear you. Well. Okay. Okay. Um, I work in uh, Ihar Pip Mohov Research Center, and uh, I'm going to talk about today about using crop wild relatives and pre breeding potato uh, in Poland. Uh, the potato parental line breeding in Poland has been carried out since 1960s on diploid and tetraploid uh, level. And the aim of this program was to uh, obtain parental lines um, useful for uh, breeding of new varieties. And the uh, uh, program introduced new sources of resistance to and uh, quality traits into Polish breeding uh, pool. And uh, uh, as a result of this uh, work, uh, in total 72 Polish varieties were uh, obtained. And uh, diploid potato breeding uh, at IHARPIP started from, from selection of uh, uh, white uh, Solano species resistant to quality traits. And in parallel, haploidization of tetraploid Solanum tuberosum cultivars and breeding lines. And such diploid forms were then crossed. And after um, few uh, cycles of combination breeding, obtained diploid forms were then uh, transferred on tetraploid level by sexual polyploidization. Uh, main programs of diploid breeding uh, at IHAR PIP in Poland uh, focus on high starch content, culinary value, or chipping. And there were also some uh, supporting sub programs uh, focus on resistant to viruses, to phytophthora infestans, to uh, resistant to soft rat and black leg, and also for uh, selection of uh, uh, forms uh, producing unreduced gametes. Several potato resistant genes and QTLs were mapped at uh, IHAR PIP. Uh, for example, genes against main potato uh, viruses or gene sent to resistance to, to Synthetium endobioticum. Uh, we mapped also QTLs for resistant to pectinolytic bacteria or resistance to, resistance to Phytophthora infestans, uh, main R genes or QTLs. A uh, majority of those genes and QTRs were mapped on diploid level, but some like uh, R2-like uh, gene or RPI SMIRA1 gene were mapped on tetraploid mapping population. Uh, we also mapped uh, um, uh, different uh, QTRs for uh, mainly, um, um, mainly quality traits, for example, tuber morphology, Crips color, starch content, or tuber greening. And uh, that's the list of the traits and uh, uh, localization of the, the QTLs on uh, the 12 chromosomes. And the darker color means uh, major main QTL. And I, would, I, would, I want to talk about resistant to Phytophthora infestans. Uh, genes for late blight resistant were mapped, uh, were located on potato genetic uh, maps, and uh, genes which were uh, mapped uh, in our uh, at IHAR PIP I uh, mark in red, and additionally I mark three of them, and I would like to talk about them more. And first. Uh, the spectrum and durability of resistance provided by uh, different RPI genes uh, are monitored in Poland uh, uh, within a population of Phytophthora infestans in a virulence uh, detached leaflet test. And he, uh, uh, tests are performed on uh, 
Black's differential uh, set from R1 to R11, uh, clones which are donors of uh, RPI FU1, uh, Ruizabalozi1, Michakanu1, and uh, cultivars which are resistant to phytophthora infestant. And uh, black color means virulent isolates, avirulent are green. And as you can see, uh, the donor R9 uh, and um, donors of genes are RPI41 and RPI RZC1 and uh, cultivars Carolus, Alouette, and Gardena are infected uh, only by few isolates of phytophthora infestants. So we can say that. Uh, those genes are still uh, effective against uh, Polish population of Phytophthora infestants. Uh, first gene, RPI41, uh, it's originated from a hybrid, uh, Stenotomum and Furea. Furea. Uh, this clone comes from TIP in 1970. And in 2006, um, we mapped this gene at the HARPIP. And in 2000 and uh, 18 uh, Polish uh, group uh, uh, created a cultivar Gardena carrying this uh, resistant RPI FU1 gene. Uh, another source of resistance to Phytophthora infestans is Solanum royce cebalosi, is a diploid wild potato species originated from uh, Bolivia. Uh, synonym of this uh, potato species is Sol Solanum brevicaule. Uh, at IHRP, we selected some clones resistant to Phytophthora infestans and clones with low tendency to enzymatic blackening and after cooking, darkening. We created a mapping population between a diploid clone of uh, Solanum ruiz cebalosi with uh, pale violet flowers and uh, the haploid bilbina susceptible to light blight with white uh, color of flowers. And we obtained, a map, we obtained population uh, in which we selected, uh, uh, we selected individuals with uh, white flowers and uh, those uh, individuals were uh, susceptible, to, susceptible to light blight and resistant, resistant forms uh, with pale white, uh, uh, pale violet, violet and uh, dark violet color of flowers. We created uh, linkage maps and uh, the gene RPI RZC1 was mapped to chromosome uh, 10 as we, as we accept, uh, as we accept uh, it was linked with flower color uh, locus F. Another source of resistance to Phytophthora infestans is Solanum mitroacanum, is a, a diploid YEBN white potato species originated from Mexico, and it is natural hybrid of Solanum bulbocastanum and Solanum pinatisectum. And we selected clones resistant to Phytophthora infestans on whole leaf test, and also clones suitable for cold chipping. That's the tuber sizes of tetraploid, diploid, and solanomitracanum uh, forms. Uh, solanomitracanum cannot be crossed directly with potato. Uh, so there are two ways of uh, transferring those resistance from solanomitracanum into potato cultivar. First is a, a mapping of R gene cloning this gene and uh, by cisgenesis transferring to solanum tuberosum. Another way is creating somatic hybrids by somatic hybridization with solanum tuberosum, um, selection of uh, resistant form, back crossing to uh, solanum tuberosum. We mapped RPI Michakan 1 gene uh, to the chromosome 7 of the potato genome. And we also applied somatic hybridization to obtain uh, somatic hybrids uh, between Solanum mitracanum and Solanum tuberosum. We selected the diploid and the traploid uh, form of Solanum, uh, of Solanum tuberosum susceptible to late blight and two clones of Solanum mitracanum resistant to Phytophthora infestans. And we also um, applied autofusion and we obtained autofused tetraploid Solanum mitracanum. And um, we tested uh, those forms, that's the number of fusion products and classes of resistance, uh, 
for the resistance to phytophthorine festans. And out of 97 solanum michacanum plus solanum tuberosum somatic hybrids, only two were resistant to phytophthorine festans. And all autofused tetraploid forms were resistant to late blight. And uh, uh, here is the question why only two somatic hybrids were resistant to phytophthorine festans and remaining 95 were susceptible. To answer this question, we check the nuclear composition of somatic hybrids genome based on DART markers. And uh, as we accept, uh, uh, in every somatic hybrids, we noted marker, uh, markers which were specific to Michoacanum parent and tuberosum parent, but also we noted some deletions of markers specific to both parents. We also check the composition of 12 chromosomes of somatic hybrids. And first, we noted that all sets of uh, chromosomes were present in every uh, single uh, somatic hybrids. And we also uh, identified uh, present and deleted markers. And those deletions were spread over the whole length of every chromosomes. And uh, that's another question. For what is the reason for, uh, for the, the, those deletions? And we have uh, hypnotized uh, that um, deletions are associated with uh, epigenetic changes generated by somatic hybridization process. And our analysis indicated an increase in DNA methylation in the somatic hybrids in comparison to their parents. And, uh, we noted that somatic hybridization changed the level of cytosine methylation in the studied potato somatic hybrids. We also think that uh, changes in epigenome um, influence the, um, the level of resistance to phytophthora infestans, but further analysis are needed. And uh, that's the BC1 progeny uh, between resistant to phytophthora infestant solanum, uh, uh, somatic hybrid solanum michacanum plus solanum tuberosum and cultivar flaming. And uh, within uh, progenies, we observe different colors of, uh, of skin, of tuber skin. And that's our department. We have uh, four uh, laboratories. And uh, that's my colleagues and friends. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, it was excellent that you could join us. Uh, now we're going to proceed with a small exercise. It's a poll that, that will be conducted by Zoom. And I think that uh, Tiago might explain how it will work. Yeah, just please uh, evaluate the, the webinar as you are going to move to the, the questions and the answer section. Just click on it and that's it and submit. Yeah, I think uh, we can move on with the questions. Uh, we have a few questions here, Maridette. And uh, I think the first question is about the participatory variety selection. And Maria Scura has already raised their hand to answer this question. Maria, just jump in and... Uh, yeah, the question it's coming from Jian Kang, and he's asking when farmers involve in assessment, they might choose wrong and get influence from other people who has a strong power opinion. Then how could we remove this kind of error? And is there some way to remove those kinds of false signal from, from farmers? So Maria. Uh, that's a, an amusing question that sometimes worries some people in participative selection because um, when farmers um, are, are called to give their opinion on whether they like the plant or whether they like the harvest or the tuber, then there is no right answer. It's a subjective, like, do you like it or don't you like it? And, and so why would a farmer think that he has to do what another farmer is is uh, choosing. It's the same problem that we have with elections. Why don't you choose the candidate that you think is the best instead of thinking that you have to choose the one that the powerful people are choosing? So no, there is no way to remove that in human, human, some humans 
uh, maybe, you know, if they're real farmers, I don't think they will choose wrongly, but um, there is, there, you know, there is not to worry too much about it, but make sure that you give a clear indication as to what you want the farmers that they should think, would I like this in my farm? Is this going to do well in my farm? Those are the questions that they need to answer, not is this the best one, because there is no right answer for that. Uh, Maria, may I add something? Sure. I think also that one of the methods that you're using is to um, vote by methods that are not open to everybody. So that in, in many instances, the farmers vote by putting a number of seeds in a bag and that that bag can't necessarily be seen by others. So isn't it true that some of the voting is done uh, to relieve the pressure from others so that the person won't feel that they have to vote along with the major group? Uh, you're right. Yeah, Meredith, I, I forgot that uh, that was instituted quite early, that when a farmer gives his opinion, he doesn't say it loudly and he doesn't have to show what he's choosing. He has seeds in his hand and he'll put it in, in a little canister or a bag or, or something and then it's counted afterwards and nobody knows who chooses which ones. But um, in, in, the, in, in the talk that I had, I, I showed one of the countings and it shows that farmers are, are similar to plant breeders and that the majority find the, the best ones easily and some have different opinions and then you have to respect it, you know, like if some people, and then in Peru, it's, we give them the seed of the ones they like so that they can try it in their own farms if, and, and that's fine. So I, I, it's, it's a hard one. I, I've seen that problem. Somebody asked a similar question when we went to see a, pro a program in Nepal and, and this, this made, uh, put the, the varieties to choose from in a room and he had people choose one by one so they couldn't see what other people were choosing, but that seemed to be an enormous amount of extra work. That's right. That's good. So just two questions here that came out from the chat and also on the question uh, box. So uh, when it's about the presentations being available, we're gonna follow up with the speakers and if they're allowed, we're gonna post all the presentations in the website and the, the, the event website, right? And the second question, it's about uh, if the workshop is being recorded, right? Yes, it's being recorded and, and the link will be provided at the website, the, the event uh, webpage as well. Okay, so we have another question here from Hamesh and he's asking a question that I think Arione could take that. Um, but maybe Pauline also could give her, you know, comments on that. So it's how many back cross, back crosses are recommended in a wide hybridization to achieve our trait of interest. I think Range trying to find new one. Yeah, can well, you get yeah. that, Arioni? Yeah. Well. Uh... I think it depends on the on the type of variety that you want to achieve. Because if you have high standard varieties, it will take longer, you know. And uh, for instance, in Brazil, we have many back crosses to reach something that we can uh, compete with other cultivars, and uh, we are not sure that it's going to make it. But uh, at least, and then it, it depends on the standard variety that we are trying to get. You have, you have any comment about back crossing, Pauline, um, the challenge on that to recover the, the genotype you, you want? Pauline, uh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think also that it depends on what you want to uh, achieve and you must uh, uh, reduce the background of white potato species. So you check the uh, additional traits like uh, uh, the level of glycalcaloids or uh, some other traits which are not uh, allowed uh, in uh, cultivars. So you, every uh, cross you have to check also uh, 
the reduction of uh, not desired traits. May I add something? Go ahead. And yes, I think that the examples that we've seen today were um, chosen also to illustrate a part of that point. And that we've seen one example in Peru in which there were only two generations before a variety is going to be released from the cross with a wild species. And uh, several additional factors are involved in that. First of all, uh, Caja Marquense has rather large tubers. It doesn't look like the challenging species that Paulina showed. So there may be some advantage to selecting uh, a tuber bearing species that bears tubers that may be close to the um, idiotype. And secondly, Peru is in short day conditions so that when a variety is released, it doesn't need to go through the additional selection for adaptation outside of its own growing habitat such as would be the case probably in the south of Brazil or in Poland. So um, I just wanted to add that the original source is also important, it's phenotype. Um, and then secondly, the, the target environment is also important because if you need to readapt the wild species to long day conditions, for example, it will take more generations. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. So, Another question that we have here coming from different persons. Uh, uh, it's about the bacterial build infection. They are asking, uh, I think Arioni could take that. It's how are you able to avoid having latent infection plants with bacterial wilt taken to the field as a false negative that they were they're resistant. And this is a concern that the, the bacterial wilt resistant clone could spread the disease to other fields since you cannot see the the, the symptoms. That's, I think, their concern. Uh, it, it is always a concern about uh, the latent uh, infection because uh, you cannot see. We have to, to use the other method of, of detecting the, the bacterium. But one point that uh, has to take into account is that uh, uh, for these varieties, uh, we have to use good seeds from good source. I think it would be the way to avoid this point because it's always a, 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 always a challenge to have some of this uh, uh, latent infection. Arione, is the breeding target also to include resistance to latent infection, or do you think that might not be possible? I think it's a, it's a, it's quite a challenge, uh, Meredith. I'm not sure that we, we could avoid that. Uh, always there is some risk on that, you know. And that's why we say that we should be very careful uh, also, especially with that on, on the seeds we use for planting, you know, to mm -hmm. avoid that. Uh, of course, the, 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 the seed and the field that they were going to use. Great. Yeah, so we have our colleague here from Burundi, Ernest. So he's asking you, Norma, so about the availability of biofortified clones in the gene bank for, for international distribution. We have in the gene bank germ, germ plants from the, for, from the breeders, no? Um, so in the way that they are developing germ plants, they have their own collection that we keep for them in vitro uh, with all of the characteristics that I was saying, cleaning the germ plants and, and put it um, in a way for being available for distribution. So um, I'm not sure if uh, uh, there is some germ plants, probably Hanele can, can uh, um, complement my question with that information. I know that the embryo rescue lines are in the gym bank for, for um, distribution, um, but I'm not sure about if, if we have some, some of these other germ plants. Yeah, no, I, I can actually compliment. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Anna. No, it's okay, Tiago, you can go ahead. You know the no. answer. <laughs> no, I guess I was about to compliment, just to say that, yes, we have the tetraploid biofortified potato that were develop in Peru and they are in the gene bank. We have received them here in Peru and distributed to some countries in Africa, including Ethiopia and Rwanda and Kenya. No, Ethiopia, Rwanda and Kenya, exactly. 
So yeah, so it's been tested in Rwanda, for instance. Uh, Placid is here with us. Uh, he, he got some nice results there. And um, yeah, so it's just red, Ernest. I think it's just about to place the order so then we can ship those materials to you. I don't know if you want to complement something, Amelie, please. I, I just want to say that if the people, they contact us and request a germ plus, we are always in, in contact with the breeders and also with the curator in order to, to know which germ plus is there available. I mean, we have um, uh, about 5,000 different, 5, different accessions of land races and, and from the breeders around almost 3,000 accessions. So, it's a lot of diversity that is in there. So we always do our best job to, to bring the information to the people, to the clients and, and, and all the process in order to acquire the Great, thanks Norma. So we have a nice question here from Danila and I think it's, a, it's an interesting question because it, can, it, has, it could have some impact on seed multiplication. And I have uh, Dave G that he, he could take this question. Uh, that it's about, uh, she want to know about the technical feasibility to apply somatic embryogenesis for multiplication of potato cultivar. Just jump in, David. Thanks for... Who David. are you directing to? No, David doubts. I'm just saying because he, he said like he would like to answer this question, I'm just giving the floor to him. I think he's still mute. Was the question to me? Huh? Did you say, ask a question to me? Yeah, because yeah, this question to you. I see that you said that you'd like to answer this question live. Oh, oh no, no, no. I that was uh, a mistake. I <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I tried to figure out how to type a question and I I, I did it wrong. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. No, that's a, that's okay. That's fine. So yeah, we have this question from Danila that it's about the embryo and somatic embryogenesis for multiplication of potato cultivar. I don't know if any one of you guys uh, know anything about this technology that could just contribute to the discussion. Have you heard about that, Merida? Well, can you hear me? Yes, I think he's referring to artificial seed. Uh, however, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not up with the latest um, concept of performance for potato or any other vegetative crop. Certainly is a temptation, but yeah. I am not aware of current progress. Okay, super. Thanks. So we have a question here from Maura. So which is why did you use 2x varieties to make the bridge from 4x instead crossing directly to 4x? Um, these 2x dihyploids or diploids. If not, why did you not use diploids? It's a question to Marie Scura, but I think also you could take it no matter that since you were there a little bit since the beginning. Maria, are you going to speak or shall we? Um, well, I didn't. I I uh, I think that the the originally when when people worked with uh, with wild species and they were diploid, they thought that they had to make them tetraploids before they could cross them to the tetraploids, and they spent a, a lot of time using colchicine, and in fact, there are some interesting parental material to virus resistance at the Max Planck Institute, having used that, but with and many back crosses. And, and uh, they were lucky that they were working with major genes. If you work with uh, minor genes, you tend to lose them on the way, trying to get um, commercial, trying to get agronomic traits. So I think this direct crossing of the wild with the dip, with a cultivated diploid makes a lot of sense to me. The trick is that it has to have two end pollen so that you can, well, that you can then uh, go to the tetraploid hybrid like, like that was the experience at SIP. Not to say that- um, I lost going... the contact. Hello? Oops. Yeah, can you... You can't hear me? I can hear you. I think we lost Mary that. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so so I think that that's a, and this method was um, was ex 
experimented and researched a lot by the Wisconsin group, and they found a lot of hybrids between, between wild species and cultivated species going directly to, to tetraploids through two and pollen. And, and I think it's a interesting breeding technique. Not to, not to say that um, you could find interesting diploids and go at, at the diploid level because we're finding, for example, that community that Norma showed the majority of the varieties they grow in that community are actually diploids. They're in a in a in a in an area which is on the western side of the Andes, which is quite wet, and um, and it diploids do better than tetraploids there because the majority of the farmers have the majority of the varieties the farmers are growing are are actually well they're diploids and triploids and interestingly. No, and we're finding that uh, with that work that SIP is genotyping that even that uh, a lot of the varieties farmers grown are not tetraploids, although although in the high Andes, the majority of the varieties are tetraploids and the thinking is that they're more resilient, but it could be that it, you know, in some areas diploids do very well. So in that sense, you don't have to go to the tetraploid level. Um, am I, I could add something? Is that okay, Marie? Please. Yes, and I'm sorry that I, if I go off, it's because I have a weak internet. It may be going off. Anyway, um, just to specify that we used um, diploid land races in the original process with that group of wild species because of the excellent culinary qualities, uh, particularly high dry matter. And also we were in the initial phases of the biofortification process. So we used uh, diploid land races with good eating and nutritional quality for the recurrent, uh, for the first back cross. Mm -hmm. That's that's good. So uh, we have just I uh, will just take one more question. So then we proceed to the closed comments, Marriott, uh, and I'm just finishing a time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the last question is it's uh, there is a question here about. Uh, the hair clones, they're fully for X, or do you get a lot of aneuploids that you, 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 your selection program removes? Uh, I think this applies what I have presented, but uh, yeah, so, but there is a step of ploid verification. I'm not sure about aneuploid if you get or not, but, uh, but there is a, a step where you do the ploid verification for the for X as you are moving on the selection of the hair clones. So they are, all the selected clones are fully for X material. And then, by the way, they have already been used in the breeding program, um, introgressing those late black genes into the main, uh, I'd say, commercial breeding program at SIP. Yeah, so I'll give the floor to you, Marinette, to, to, to make the close comments and, and keep the people engaged for tomorrow. And thank you so much. Okay. Well, it's been an excellent opportunity uh, to hear from breeding programs uh, around the world, from Peru to other Latin American countries, Europe, and from Africa. And also, um, I think that we had excellent interaction with the audience. And what we could see from today uh, with respect, looking forward to tomorrow's uh, presentations, is the complex process of introgressing new traits uh, from wild potato species into uh, heterogeneous tetraploid varieties. As we've been discussing, this can take many, many generations. And also, each of the breeders referred to the large number of traits that must be maintained uh, while a new trait is being introgressed. Those traits are usually, in most breeding programs, already um, accumulated in either elite clones or an advanced population. So the challenge is to introduce new traits into improved populations through population improvement or into elite clones through a modified back cross breeding scheme, always while paying attention to maintain uh, the previously uh, achieved traits, whether they would be yield, quality. We mentioned a bunch of other diseases, early blight. Um, virus resistance is very important. Um, so certainly the use of crop wild relatives in a tetraploid breeding program 
is very complicated. I think one of the um, excellent uh, examples made by the program in Poland as to uh, how to encourage the use of crop uh, wild relatives in breeding is for breeders to keep in mind getting that material into a usable form because it does take so long, maybe 10 or 12 years. Uh, and in many cases, the next user of a pre-breeding program isn't willing to take the step to use something that still looks or behaves like a wild uh, crop. So I think that one lesson uh, from the Polish breeding program is that they're very strong on working with parental line development. And they promote those parental lines with the resistances that they carry so that the advanced breeding program can use as fast and quickly as possible in a variety development scheme. Uh, we also heard of a very few examples of the importance of data management. Um, I think that uh, that's one of the priorities of the crop trust in supporting the crop wild relatives. And um, I think that there's a new and very useful program available from the Scottish Crop Research Institute. And SIP has also developed a number of data management schemes for handling uh, data such as was just asked, perhaps Tiago could look back into the raw data and examine whether there were in fact some aneuploids uh, found and not selected in the process of developing the herd plants. Um, so I'd like to thank each of the speakers uh, for accepting uh, the opportunity and also for staying on time and sharing with us your research. Uh, thank you to the organiz organization, the I uh, Information Technology Unit at SIP. And Tiago, uh, back to you for signing off. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, I just would like to thank everyone and would like to thank the team that's been behind that the organization. It's been amazing. I think we're just ending the time. And please stay tuned for tomorrow. I think we're going to have a very nice discussion. And thank you so much.